Hello, my name is Beth Mahaffey with Highway to Holiness. Today we're going to continue with part two of Where the Melchizedek Priesthood Meets the Levitical. In part one of Where the Melchizedek Priesthood Meets the Levitical, we noted that in addition to the Levitical sacrificial system, there were at least a couple of times in which people were used as a substitutionary sacrifice for atonement. Both of these events were typological of Yeshua's crucifixion and death. In addition to these typological, prophetic, and substitutionary deaths, Scripture also tells us that no one shall bear the sins of their fathers or sons. As the sinless Son of God, Yeshua is qualified to be a substitutionary, atoning sacrifice for sins, trespasses, iniquities, and uncleanness for all mankind. Yeshua is the antitype. His sacrifice was offered via the order of Melchizedek. All sacrificial systems have altars and priests, so we'll take a look at both of these before discussing the heavenly pattern and the connection between the earthly and heavenly realms. Altars can be stationary or mobile. An example of a stationary altar would be at the temple in Jerusalem. A mobile altar would be the one that was at the tabernacle in the wilderness or the body of a believer in Yeshua. Altars are places that are consecrated. They're places of worship, places where covenants are made, and places of connection and communication between the earthly and spiritual realms where demons or angels can ascend and descend between the heavenly and earthly realms. They're places of fellowship, they're places of substitution or exchange, which can be via sacrifices or offerings. As such, they can be places of atonement and forgiveness. Altars can be righteous, which are associated with angels and Yehovah God, or they can be unrighteous, which are associated with demons, Satan, idolatry, and witchcraft. Anywhere there's an altar, there is a priest and a priesthood associated with it. Now let's consider man's first sin. There are certain details left out of this event in Scripture that we have to make assumptions about before we can move forward. God is the king of his heavenly kingdom, and he fits the description of Melchizedek, who was without genealogy. After Adam and Eve sinned, we know God killed an animal to provide clothing for Adam and Eve. We assume the killing of this animal was a sacrifice that provided both atonement and forgiveness of their sin. Shortly thereafter, we see Cain and Abel bringing offerings to God. Since God's animal was a sacrifice, there had to be an altar where God officiated as priest. Once Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had the propensity to sin again. The only thing that kept them from being completely like demons was the possibility of eating from the tree of life. God banned them from the Garden of Eden to prevent them from eating from the tree of life so they would not remain permanently in their new sinful condition. All priests, whether righteous or wicked, have an altar they attend to. Altars can be evil altars where Satan, idols, or false gods are worshipped and altars can be godly altars where Yehovah is worshipped. Since God was the first priest and set up the first altar on earth, unrighteous or evil altars are a result of Satan and his demons copying what God did. Satan is a master counterfeiter who copies the many things of God for his advantage. There are probably as many as 50 false gods if not more, mentioned in the Bible. Sometimes there may be one God that went by different names depending on the territory it was worshipped in. Each false God had altars and priests who attended those altars. Evil altars can be set up in our own lives in various ways. Whenever we idolize something, an invisible altar can be created. If something has an ungodly effect on you when you are engaged in a certain activity, there is likely an altar operating behind it. These altars, whether visible or invisible, 
must be torn down by faith in the name of Yeshua through confession and repentance of your sins, trespasses, and iniquities. Even altars set up in the lives of your ancestors up to four generations back or ten generations back for any kind of sexual immorality can have an effect on what's going on in your life. Those must be torn down in the same way. Other than what was intimated in the Garden of Eden, the first priest mentioned in Scripture is found in Genesis 14:18. Melchizedek was the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High, also known as El Elyon, or Supreme God. What is odd is that in all of Scripture there is no genealogy mentioned about him. The Torah purposely shows us the genealogy of godly men, but it does not share other genealogies unless we need to know them. These other people and their genealogies are not as significant as the primary ones, and those would include Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes. Some have suggested that Melchizedek, which is a title and not a name, may have been Noah's son Shem, but we know his genealogy, so this may not be true. Hebrews 7.3 describes Melchizedek as without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Some suggest that Melchizedek was or is Yeshua. Whether he was, is, or not, he was definitely typological of Yeshua, our high priest and king. Either way, Abraham knew who this man was since he honored him with tithes of all from the war. The title Melchizedek means my king of righteousness. There was no other righteous priesthood mentioned in Abram's day or prior. Normally, the firstborn sons were the priests of each household. When Yehovah struck the firstborn Egyptian males, he sanctified to himself the firstborn males of Israel for that purpose. But because of the sin involving the golden calf they had made at Mount Sinai, Yehovah exchanged the firstborn males of Israel for the Levites. Numbers 3, 44-48 explains how the exchange of the firstborn males for the Levites was carried out. Then Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and the livestock of the Levites instead of their livestock. The Levites shall be mine, I am Yehovah. And for the redemption of the 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, who are more than the number of the Levites, you shall take five shekels for each one individually. You shall take them in the currency of the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel of twenty geras, and you shall give the money with which the excess number of them is redeemed to Aaron and his sons. The sons of Levi, the families of Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, would serve Yehovah by caring for the tabernacle and its furnishings according to their assigned duties. Aaron and his sons would serve as priests, so really the priesthood should technically be called the Aaronic priesthood instead of the Levitical priesthood. However, we see Levitical priesthood used in Scripture. Not all Levites are priests. Only the sons of Aaron, who are also Levites, are priests. In the future, the priests will be the sons of Zadok, who descended from the line of Aaron, because Ezekiel 44.15 says, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says Jehovah God. These were and will be the earthly priests of the Aaronic priesthood. Moses was commanded to build the tabernacle, including its furnishings, according to the pattern that was shown to him. This pattern was a copy and shadow based on what is in heaven. Exodus 25, 8-9 and 40 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. 
according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. The holy place included the curtain, the golden lampstand, the table for the bread of the presence, or the bread of the faces, also known as the showbread, with its poles, dishes, pans, pitchers, and bowls, the golden altar of incense with poles. Yeshua said, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. I pray not only for my disciples, but also for the ones who will believe in me through their word. As you can see, Yeshua is typologically paralleling the furnishings of the tabernacle. The most holy place included the Ark of the Covenant, its poles, and the mercy seat with a cherub at each end, which was God's throne. Only the sons of Aaron could go into the most holy place once a year. Yeshua also said, Where I go, you cannot come. I am from above, and I am not of this world. Yeshua is identifying with and paralleling what's going on in the most holy place. Hebrews 8, 3 through 6 says, For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Based on verse 4, the earthly Levitical priesthood was still offering sacrifices when the book of Hebrews was written. Since the earthly tabernacle and its furnishings are a shadow of the heavenly one, we must keep in mind that there are likely some differences between what is in the earthly and heavenly realms that we are not fully aware of. This includes exactly what was offered on the altars in each realm. In the scripture, we find various statements that clue us in to the fact that animals can sometimes represent people or vice versa. Judah was referred to as a lion's whelp. Issachar was referred to as a strong donkey. Dan was referred to as a serpent by the way. Naphtali was referred to as a deer let loose. Benjamin was referred to as a ravenous wolf. Yehovah's people were referred to as the sheep of his pasture. And Yeshua was referred to as the Lamb of God or the Passover Lamb who takes away the sin of the world as well as the line of the tribe of Judah. There are also allusions to Yeshua being the goat used as a sin offering on the Day of Atonement, as well as the bull cut up by the priests of Baal at the Battle of Bulls on Mount Carmel. Although this bull was killed, Baal failed to consume it. This compares thematically to the fact that Yeshua was killed, but his body did not decay. Elijah's bull that Yehovah consumed with fire likely represented Satan, who will be thrown in the lake of fire. It also seems that the second goat, the goat for Azazel, from the Day of Atonement, depicts Bar Abbas, who was released instead of Yeshua, and Satan, who will be released from the abyss, which is mentioned in Revelation. The idea that animals can sometimes represent people goes to show that it's quite likely that the unclean and clean animals, fish, and birds of the dietary laws represent different kinds of people too whether it's clean, unclean, and unholy mixtures. As we eat clean things, we should be making sure that our characteristics are consistent with what is holy or set apart to Yehovah. The offerings and rituals for consecration and cleansing that are found in the book of Leviticus are primarily types and shadows of Yeshua, but there are other things represented as well 
depending on how you look at the themes and their patterns. The grain, sin, and guilt offerings were considered most holy. The ascending or whole burnt offering was a picture of a complete set-apartness and devotion to God. Excluding the drink offerings, the central focus of the five main offerings is the peace offering, the goal of which is reconciliation, peace, and fellowship. The consecration of Aaron and his sons involved various sacrifices, and similar themes in this consecration are seen in Yeshua's death and burial. The cleansing of lepers required two birds, one killed and one living, which represented Yeshua's death and resurrection. The procedure for the preparation of the ashes of the red heifer represents details related to Yeshua's death and burial. We must remember that the Levitical system was good. It did what it was designed to do, which was provide atonement and forgiveness, as well as point us to Yeshua Messiah, our Melchizedek High Priest. However, the Melchizedek system is better. Yeshua is the latter or connection between the heavenly and the earthly priesthoods. Genesis 28:12 says, Then he, Jacob, dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Originally, we didn't know what this ladder represented, but Yeshua revealed what it was all about. John 1, 51 says, and he, referring to Yeshua, said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Right now, only the Melchizedek priesthood is functioning, but the Aaronic priesthood, the sons of Zadok, will run parallel to the Melchizedek's priesthood during the Millennial Kingdom. Some people may find this shocking. After all, Yeshua died once for all. Many understand that the Levitical offerings looked ahead to Yeshua. However, they will be offered again during Yeshua's millennial reign. This may be so that we can look back and see the Levitical system that did not operate in our lifetimes, as well as better appreciate what Yeshua did for us. Now let's take a closer look at the Melchizedek priesthood. The righteous earthly and heavenly priesthoods form a widespread parallel of sorts in Scripture. Melchizedek was the king and priest of Salem, and Salem means peace, but it also referred to Jerusalem. Aaron and his descendants were the earthly priests. These two priesthoods parallel what came later and what is still yet to come. Melchizedek which is now referring to Yeshua, is the king and priest of Zion. And Zion means citadel, and it also refers to Jerusalem. And of course, we'll have the sons of Zadok who will be serving as the earthly priest during the millennial reign of Yeshua. Melchizedek is mentioned once in Genesis 14:18, again in Psalm 110:4, and several times in Hebrews 5 through 7. In Genesis 14, Melchizedek was described as the king of Salem, or Jerusalem, who brought out bread and wine in the valley of Saveh, or the king's valley, after a war had taken place between four Shemite kings, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Anoch, king of Elisar, Chedor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, and five Hamite kings, Berah, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admah, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and king of Bela, Zoar. The Hamites had been in subjugation to the Shemites until they rebelled in the thirteenth year. Chedorlaomer defeated and spoiled the rebels. They also had taken Lot, Abram's nephew, captive from Sodom. Someone escaped and informed Abram of what had happened. Abram and his men came to the rescue. He divided his forces, attacked the Shemite forces, brought back all the goods, Lot, women, and other people. Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High, or El Elyon, or Supreme God, 
blessed both Abram and God Most High. It was at this point that Abram gave Melchizedek tithes of everything. Many generations later, the Aaronic priesthood was created as part of the Sinai covenant as previously mentioned. Nothing else was mentioned about the priesthood of Melchizedek until Psalm 110, 1-7. Yehovah said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Yehovah shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers as soldiers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Yehovah has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Adonai is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore he shall lift up the head. In this psalm we see David's Lord, who is in the bosom of the Father and at his right hand, as an eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek, as well as a warrior king. He is none other than Yeshua, also known as Jehovah, our righteousness, in Jeremiah 23, 5-6. There are several things we can learn about Yeshua and the priesthood of Melchizedek in the apostolic writings, also known as the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews confirms that God called his son, Yeshua, a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, and he says Yeshua became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Yeshua, the Lamb of God, was slain from the foundation of the world, and everyone who dwells on the earth, whose names are not written in the book of life, will worship Yeshua, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Besides being slain in the heavenly realm, Yeshua was slain in the earthly realm when he was crucified on the cross. Hebrews 9, 11-14 says, But Messiah came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place of the heavenly tabernacle once for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, Yeshua's Melchizedek offering is an antitype of the Aaronic offerings, it connects the heavenly and the earthly altars. It seems that the Melchizedek priesthood had been operating in heaven in parallel with the Aaronic priesthood while the tabernacle or temple on earth has been in operation. Even in the future, the Aaronic priesthood will be operating in the future temple, which is described in Ezekiel, while Yeshua, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, reigns over the world in Jerusalem. Ezekiel twenty forty through 44 says, For on my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says Jehovah God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require your offerings and the first fruits of your sacrifices, together with all your holy things. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. Then you shall know that I am Yehovah when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. And there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you were defiled, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of all the evils that you have committed." Then you shall know that I am Yehovah when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, says Yehovah God. Then he said to me, The north chambers and the south chambers, which are opposite the separating courtyard, are the holy chambers where the priests who approach Yehovah 
shall eat the most holy offerings. There they shall lay the most holy offerings, the grain offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering, for the place is holy. Seven days they shall make atonement for the altar and purify it, and so consecrate it. When these days are over, it shall be on the eighth day, and thereafter, that the priest shall offer your burnt offerings and your peace offerings on the altar, and I will accept you, says Jehovah God. And one lamb shall be given from a flock of two hundred from the rich pastures of Israel. These shall be for grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings, to make atonement for them, says Jehovah God. All the people of the land shall give this offering for the prince in Israel. Then it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the feast, the new moons, the Sabbaths, and at all the appointed seasons of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering, the grain offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. Notice that Ezekiel 45.17 says the feasts of Yehovah, which are shadows of God's plans, will still be observed, so we should be observing them now, too. Colossians 2.16-17 says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Messiah. Let me emphasize again Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. This is the primary means of atonement for sin, trespasses, and guilt. Colossians 1.13-14 says, He, referring to Yeshua, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Romans three twenty three through 26 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua. Hilasterion means the relating to an appeasing or expiating, having placating or expiating force, expiatory, a means of appeasing or expiating or a propitiation. And that's exactly what Yeshua's sacrifice or crucifixion was. According to the Oxford Dictionary on Lexico, expiate, the verb, means to atone for, referring to guilt or sin. It's from the Latin expiate or appeased by sacrifice. Expiatory is an adjective, and it means in an expiatory sacrifice, the blood which is shed is regarded as wiping out a transgression. As you can see, the apostolic writings show the fulfillment of what was written and foreshadowed in the Tanakh concerning Yehovah's plan for mankind, peace and reconciliation through blood atonement. This is where the Melchizedek priesthood met the Levitical. Again, my name is Beth Mahaffey with Highway to Holiness. Thank you for joining me today for part two of Where the Melchizedek Priesthood Meets the Levitical. Until next time, Shalom.